Welcome to the book at the end of the shelf. My name is Christopher St. Clark. On this cold and windy evening, I'm sat alone and in the dark. I'm here to read you bedtime stories that are far from PG or mild. I wouldn't choose to play this podcast if you're listening with your child. Some of these are dark, some are funny, most are downright gory. But when you open the book at the end of the shelf, there is always a bedtime story. Episode 6. A Year and a Day Hello there, my friends. What a fine evening it is tonight. I'm going to share with you my story. It may cause some discomfort or fright. If it does, then... Well, you get the grip, because it's not you that has to live through it. I'm the one that's stuck with this condition. I'm the one that feckin' blew it. If you were to guess my age, you think I'm 20? 22? Well, actually, as it happens, I'm 90, and I, and I swear to God, that's true. I was born in 1933 in a little town known as Cork. My mother was a weaver, and my unemployed father too fat to walk. We can laugh at them now. They're long dead. Buried in the dust. As soon as you will all be, from dusk till dawn till dusk. Now you must be wondering how I'm here talking to you now, so you feel fresh and handsome. Well, well here, I'll I'll tell you how. I'm not a time traveller in the typical sci-fi sense, no. It's more like I'm stuck inside a tornado and I've only got myself a tent. The 12th of October 58, I had just turned 25. I was young and dumb and stupid and ungrateful to be alive. I was at the edge of the woods trying to pick my Elsie a rose when the heavens opened on me, started to soak me from head to toe. I rushed into the woods to find some form of shelter when I found a little old lady. Well, I didn't just see her, I, I felt her. I sensed she'd been watching me. She gave me this smug sort of smirk like she'd known me forever and thought I was a fucking jerk. What do you want with me? She crackled through three teeth. Nothing, I'm just hiding. It's drier in here than the heat. What are you doing in the cold? You you look like you're 85. Fuck you, you little prick. You don't know how long I've been alive. I, I'm not being rude, I'm just saying. You are a little bit old and it's pissing it down with rain and, and I don't want you to get cold. 85. 85. I've been alive much longer than that. I watched the fall of the Roman Empire, you feckin' little twat. Well, clearly a delusional old bint, I rose my eyes and walked away. But just before I turned, her whole body started to flay. She was tearing herself apart in a blinding ball of light, her luminescent skin shooting out into the rainy night. And the ball of light that remained shot straight into my chest. And that's the last thing I remember that night. And that's probably for the best. I awoke at the top of the heath and the morning sun was bright. I was far away from the woods where I had found the old lady at night, and through all the rain that had come before, not a cloud was in the sky, and as I placed my hand upon the grass, I felt that it was dry. I I picked up a flower and stumbled home to my girl. My head was throbbing, and she was the only thing that I wanted to see in the world. But as I opened the door to my house, I saw Elsie stood inside, but she took one look at me and screamed like someone had died. And the scream was quickly followed by her dropping to the floor and breaking down and weeping as I quickly rushed to the door. Uh, Elsie, what's wrong? I'm sorry I didn't come home. I've got a crazy story to tell you. I'll I'll pop the kettle on the stove. Well, then she got up and slapped me. So hard it left the mark. Ah, What did you do that for? I was only at the park. You little fucking shit. I have waited for a year. Come on then. What was it? Another lass? Gambling? Beer? It was only one night, Elsie. I'll tell you a hundred times, I got knocked out by this lady. It is 1959! Ah, no it isn't. What the hell are you talking about? It's October 1459. A year and a day is how long you've been out. It took me almost all day to realise that... Well, she was telling the truth. 
When I saw my ma, she slapped me so hard that I almost lost a tooth. My cat had died. It was 14 at the time that I went missing. But it had already started getting lost and spraying the walls when it was pissing. Hawaii had become a state. I missed the invention of the hovercraft. They said it wouldn't be long until a man could stand on the moon. Well, that's just daft. At the end of the night, the atmosphere was frosty. I had tried to explain as much as I could, but the night before, well, that night had cost me. Elsie had come round to the idea that what I was saying was true, but it, it didn't get back the year and the day that I'd left her feeling blue. She found the strength to hug me, and I kissed her on the head. Then no more words were uttered, and we both just went to bed. Sleep took me quickly, dropping into a heavy doze. I remember my last thought being that I, I never found a vase for Elsie's rose. The next morning, I awoke, but Elsie wasn't lying next to me. I was back at the top of the heath, and this curse was plain to see. I found the first person I saw and grabbed them by the shoulder, and as I demanded from them the year, I learned that this heath was a year and a day older. Shit, it had happened again. I worked myself into a panic attack. Everything that I had grown used to had been derailed from its tracks. I sprinted home to Elsie to repeat much of the same embrace. There was the hugging, the crying, the drop to the floor, and of course the slap across my face. We bawled our eyes out together, trying to accept this new situation. We hugged each other all day and tried to think of an explanation. And then when that didn't work out, we were intimate together. For me, it had been two days, but for her, it had felt like forever. And the time afterwards was strange. A gentle breathing in my ear, knowing that when I fell asleep, she wouldn't see me for a year. I woke her, I had to, I had to experience every second. Because who knew what would happen in the time I was gone and midnight would soon beckon. I told her that I loved her and, and then once more I made her cry. I told her that there was no point being with a man who would still be 25 when she died. Who would miss almost every moment of her days, her nights, her life. She would only have one day, once a year, to be my girlfriend. Never my wife. Never to have kids. They would only outgrow me. Never to experience the beautiful sights of the world, it was just the town of Cork that I would see. I would watch the world float by in a lost and foggy haze, skipping through Elsie's years as I only scraped through my days. We kissed each other goodbye and wished one another good luck. I closed my eyes for one second, and then I awoke back up in the muck. But there, <laughs> there she was. The most radiant sight in the land, looking down upon me with a rose in her hand. A tear in her eye and yet a smile across her cheeks. She lunged at me and hugged me so hard I thought I heard my bones creak. She looked almost different to me now, slightly fuller in the face. But she felt the same for sure as we had our long embrace. What are you doing, Elsie? Did you really think I wouldn't come? I have time to enjoy my life, but but you, you have no one. And there started our new normal of me letting Elsie go, but still seeing her for every day being told what she wanted me to know, about her life, her experiences, her maturing into the lady that was just a young girl when she blew that kiss at me and made me. I decided there was a role, something I didn't want to be told. And that was whether she had met someone else, as she rapidly did grow old. I couldn't blame her if she said yes, I wouldn't want to be alone this way. But if she ever decided to tell me, well it would definitely ruin our day. And a day was all we had. So we filled it with our talk, and we'd laugh and play and enjoy, swimming, fucking and long walks. And my life was kinda great, for those next few following days. It was like the love of my life was falling for me, again repeatedly, in different ways. But those days were saddening for Elsie. The time was taking its toll. Ten days had quickly been and gone and she was suddenly 30 years old. And I was still 25. A young lad from the past, dipping in and out of her life knowing this just couldn't last. And I was right. Because on that day, she broke the news to me that she was moving away. It brought her pain to tell me it was no easy feat. 
but that night when I'd go to bed, I'd have no idea if we'd ever meet. She was moving across to Britain, a little village in Norfolk. I suspected she'd found the fellow who lived there. I was shit out of luck. We said goodbye to each other for what would be the final time. She was growing into a woman and, well, her life had outgrown mine. I prepared myself for the heath, wondering how I would ever transcend it. And at that moment when I looked at my life, I decided tomorrow I would end it. But when I fell asleep, after we'd uttered our last goodbyes, my world flipped again once more as I came to open my eyes. I was in a new place, no longer on the heath, no longer in the town of Cork, no grass or muck beneath. I was somewhere new. How the fuck could this be? Had my curse been lifted, did someone fucking move me? I was out in the open just by a stream, right in the centre of a little village, as idyllic as a dream. And I ran and saw a woman. She had a wee dog by her feet, and through my panicked moaning and swearing, she remained ever so sweet. She calmly told me the year. 23rd of October, 69. That all checked out okay, but something didn't align. Where the hell am I? You're in Norfolk, my dear. There's a pub just there, if you want to go have a beer. And I did. I bloody well did. I stumbled into that pub, crashed against the bar, flicked away the cigarette stubs, screamed at the bartender, Do you know Elsie? Elsie Brown? He looked at me as if I was mad with a strong disgruntled frown. Sorry, my man, I don't know anyone by that name. They're new here, they're new here. I sounded fucking insane. I've travelled from the past. I really need to see her. She's somewhere here in Norfolk. Look, why don't you order a beer? Fuck this! I shouted and turned towards the door. When the man who was playing darts finished writing down his score and beckoned to me with a gesture that calmly said, Come here. And so I plodded grumpily along, trying to hold back all my tears. I know Elsie, Elsie Brown. She's just moved in down the road. Number 32. Now go buy me a drink, you little toad. I, I brought the man his beer and legged it out the room. My legs pounding against the ground, I would be in her arms soon. Could you imagine that? Whatever this curse may be, I thought of it as something directly related to me. I knew the old woman had done this out of spite when I stumbled through the woods on that dark and rainy night. But I thought it was to hurt me. But now I'm not so sure. I was affirmed by this relocation that mine and Elsie's love was pure. To be so connected to a person that even with my hex I'll be taken straight to my gal that our lives will intersect. And I believed in every story, every princess and prince charming in true love soulmates and that I was born to be Elsie's darling. I found her at the door and we stared into each other's eyes like we just managed to bag ourselves the biggest fairground prize. And we laughed. We found it funny. So now we were kind of stuck together. After all this fucking talking about leaving for Norfolk forever. And our embrace was like a drug injected to my soul. And the euphoria of it helped numb the pain of her growing old. We took our years and days as they came, one by one by one. In ten more nights for me, Elsie had turned 41. We picked up where we left off. We were just doing it in a different land. She would talk about her year as I'd stroke her hair and hold her hand. And oh yeah, she'd had a kid. Yeah, we're pretty sure it's mine. He was born between Cork and Norfolk and he was spoiled all the time. Both her families had pulled together to raise the boy and raise him right. He wouldn't ever really know his father, but it was better if I stayed out of sight. We did, however, meet once, when Elsie turned 43. We were making out on the couch, and the fucker walked in on me. He was 13 by this point, yet I had known of his existence for a week. He stormed out of the house, wondering what 25-year-old would have the cheek to make out with his mar in such a blatant way. But she never did tell him who I was. He still doesn't know today. When Elsie turned 60, we, uh, we stopped having sex. The, uh, the attraction had died out, well, well, only in the bed. I still found her attractive. For me, it was in the eyes, in the way she smiled at me and her cute little sighs. And the days into her 60s, well, 
they'd be called the Nartys for you. We're quiet her and solemn and, and both of us were blue. She had less and less to tell me, less and less to say. And I actually found myself becoming bored one day. Could you imagine that? A whole year apart and we had nothing to say to each other and, and that just broke my heart. And then in the 2010s, she started to forget. She'd get confused about who I was, who we were and how we met. And there was nothing more that was fun. My life became a slog looking after an old lady who would often just sit there like a log. You're probably wondering why I'm telling you this, with you right here, right now. There's a hundred questions you must have and I wish I could tell you how. How this thing works, where I'm going, where I'll be when you're 99. Will I still be plodding away to the very end of time? I don't know if truth be told, and I don't really care. But there's a reason I'm talking to you today why I'm taking this time to share. Because today is the day Elsie died. She managed to hold out for me. They thought it would have happened weeks ago, but no, not my Elsie. I wanted to say more to her. I wanted to kiss her the way I did when she was my age, when we were just a couple of kids. This whole thing's been two months for me. That's all that it has been, and I've been living the same day over and over like some twisted fucking dream, yet in that short space of time, I grew completely numb to her. When I saw her lying there, I didn't even try to stir. How can that be? That we could grow so far apart, we were magically connected to each other, she was with me from the very start, and for her it took six decades to slowly lose interest. But it only took two months for me, and that hits me in my chest. My son will be sought in the funeral. He is 50 years old. I... I don't really know what to do with all this. It's just growing slowly ever more cold. Sorry. I am so sorry, I am... I'm making you all so sad. I, I'm painting a very bleak picture here, but, but it really wasn't that bad. We had a lot of fun. We were born to be together. I really believe that we would have done this forever if, if I aged the same as her. If I wasn't walking through life so slowly, I would have found a way to make those final days for her less lonely. And I'm learning a lot about myself though, about what I will become. And I think if I get to the age of 80, I might just outlive the fucking sun. I look at people's faces, growing old so thick and fast, as you worry about your lives, about whether things will last. And yeah, I guess life is scary. Mortgages aren't cheap now, I understand. I guess your average house now must cost you something mental, like 40 grand. But if I can tell you anything at all, it's try to feckin' smile. Try to tell yourself you're important, that your life's somewhat worthwhile, because honestly it's not. You'll be dead for me in 60 days, but believing in your self-worth, that is what will make you stay. And everything can seem bleak, but you can do something about it. You need to work hard to find the things you love. If an opportunity comes up, don't doubt it. Find the thing in your life that makes you who you are. I found that for me and Elsie, that in my career, my house, my car. And I'll tell you how it goes, when I'm finally allowed to leave. It may be in a hundred thousand years, or maybe today is the end for me. We already know that Elsie and I are linked, that I moved country so we could be found. So maybe I'll just join her tomorrow. Maybe I'll join her in the ground. Or maybe I'll keep walking. Until my tomorrows decide to stop coming. Until the well stops turning, the sun stops burning. And the wind on that heath stops humming. Wow, thank you so much uh, for listening to A Year and a Day. Um, I'm very proud of that one. It was a uh, quite tough one to write. Um, I'm also hugely proud to announce that A Year and a Day is being adapted for the stage. 
Um, it's going to be a one-person show. I will play it as I have now. Uh, you've heard about a 20-minute version. Uh, we'll be doing an hour-long version, and so we'll be introducing many more characters. Um, we have a bit of a kind of crime storyline going on there. I'm really excited about bringing this to the stage. So we'll be doing a uh, we'll be doing like a test performance in in Norfolk at some point, um, and then we'll be going across to Edinburgh Fringe uh, 2023, where we'll be doing a two-week run at Space UK. So I'm super excited. Get those tickets. Keep following uh, the book at the end of the shelf. Keep following Raising Cane Productions, Christopher St. and Clark on all of our socials. Keep up to date with projects. Thank you for listening to this series. I hope you liked it. If you have liked it, please share it. Tell people about it because if you, if we get people listening to it, we'll make more. Um, it's such a nice little creative output for me to get these out there. I really hope you've enjoyed them. Keep an eye out um, for Nathan's return. Thank you for listening to the book at the end of the shelf. <laughs>